Thank you, Lord. Praise God. I didn't really give tonight's message a title, but if I was going to title it, I'd probably say Jesus hates religion. <laughs> Amen. Let's take a look at Philippians chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 9 through 10. We shared this at the Sunday night Bible study. I don't know how I ended up with such a gumbo of scripture, but praise God. Philippians chapter 3, verses uh, 9 and 10 is where we are tonight. It says, and be found in him, not at having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And I just wanted to kind of stop there before we go into verse 10. So in verse 9, it talks about that I don't, that I, that I, he, Paul's prayer is that he desires to be found in him. He's talking about Jesus and that he would not have his own righteousness, which is of the law, but that that righteousness, which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. And so what I wanted to just kind of share real quick, the first thing I wanted to say was this, was that when it comes to the law, and you know, we had a particular teaching from this guy, I think his name was Mark DeJesus, that kind of filtered through the little text uh, church. And he was using the terminology performance, I think, driven Christianity. I know for a long time I used the terminology performance based Christianity. I need you to understand that it's important that we that we get a little bit of a revelation on the word law and how it's connected to our lives in the New Testament because I used to, and I know I shared this recently, but I used to when I was offshore, when I was a new convert, and I would see the words law even in the book of Romans, oftentimes I would pass it up because I would think, well, that doesn't affect me. That's not pertaining to me because I'm in the new covenant. But you need to understand that there's a, such a thing that we can move into legalism. As a matter of fact, the whole letter to the Galatian church that Paul wrote Many scholars call it Galatianism, and they say that the Judaizers were some Jewish people that had gotten saved, but that they felt everybody also needed to be circumcised. Now, I know that people aren't going around teaching that people have to be circumcised today, but essentially what was being said was, was that you had to add something to your faith in Jesus in order to be made really holy. And there's been a plethora of things that have been added to Christ since I've been in the church. And there's always some type of a new something that's coming around the corner that's trying to convince the church that they need something in addition to or something added to other than faith in Christ. And what I got to tell you is this, is that it's faith in Jesus that gets you saved. See, a lot of times people get confused when you use the word cross. They think that you're, that you're mostly just talking about salvation. But I'm, I want you to know that, first of all, God does. And I know I've been preaching that a lot lately. He wants true conversions. Amen. He wants people to truly have a conversion in their heart. And when that happens, you know it's happened because the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. And you're never the same. That's what we were singing yeah. in that song. Yeah. I'll never be the same. Because when you get saved, amen, and the Holy Ghost moves in, he will. He starts changing things, amen. Yeah, yeah. He'll start kicking stuff around. He'll start stirring stuff up. He'll start bringing conviction to your heart, amen. And that's how you know that you really got saved is when the Holy Spirit shows up. But, but what happens is, is that many times people begin to be taught that they have to add things to their faith. And so now what I'm talking about is freedom, and liberty because you see the same way you received him that's Colossians chapter 2 verse 6 you don't really have to go there but the same way you received him so shall you continue to walk in him so there's an aspect of faith in Christ and what he did for us at the cross that's more than just just for salvation but that it's for continued living with the Lord. So we, we have to understand that it's the righteousness of Jesus that was given to us as a gift. The word of God says that righteousness has a name. 
In Romans chapter 3, verse 21, G righteousness has a name. His name is Jesus, okay? It doesn't say that in there, so don't turn to that. But, but what it's saying is, is that Jesus is righteousness, is what, what I want you to know. Romans chapter 5, 17 says that righteousness is a gift. Amen. And so you need to understand that Jesus gave his life and that an exchange took place and we were given the righteousness of Christ Amen. as a gift when we put faith in what Jesus did for us. Amen. The Bible, Romans chapter four says that righteousness is imputed. What does that mean? It's been given to us. That's how God now sees us as he's given us the righteousness of Jesus. It's kind of like somebody might say, I, I impute, you know, or I would say, I, I'm trying to give you the, an example of the word impute. Uh, you know, people have imputed to me selfishness. What that would mean is, is that they were, they were saying, Matt is selfish. Okay, but whenever righteousness is imputed to a person, what that's saying is that God has given us the righteousness of Jesus. He's given it to us. It's been given to us as a gift. It's not your righteousness. It's the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. And what I need you to understand is you can learn to rest in that. See, if you're not, if you're not careful, you'll end up like Martha and you'll be working, 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 working. And it's important to work for the kingdom of God, but you can't work for righteousness. Yeah. And when people don't understand and learn how to rest in Christ's righteousness, they become caught up in performance-based Christianity, a type of law that's added to the grace message, which is a completely free gift. Hallelujah. And you need to understand that and you need to learn how to rest in that. And when you do learn how to rest in that, there's great freedom and liberty, amen, that, that will begin to bring cause like whatever it is that you've been bound by, whatever it is you've been praying about. What I want you to know is, is that when you begin to enter into the rest of Jesus, these things that you have tried and strived and attempted to get freedom over, they start to break off like, like rotten, well, you know, like overripe fruit on a tree. It just starts to fall off because it's the work of the Holy Spirit. So that's what I want you to understand is that it's the work of the Holy Spirit that's moving through what Jesus purchased for you when he died on the cross. And when you apply your faith to the eternal plan of God. Like in that word, he said, I am the ancient of days. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have delivered my promise to you. I will not be deterred. I have delivered the lamb. And if you will put your faith in that, hope in that, trust in that, and fight the good fight of faith, whatever it is that you've been dealing with, whatever it is that you've been going through, hallelujah, freedom is on the way. And I want you to know that. But there's a performance-based law-type Christianity that wants to get in the way. Preachers many times are preaching that type of a message. I know that I was saved, really, in a church that but not long after I was saved, I was told these kinds of things. And, I mean, they meant well, and praise God for that pastor that led me to the Lord. I'll tell you that much. But, but anyway, in verse 10, it says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection... And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. Now, that word conformable has the idea uh, that something would take on the same morphology, the form or the fashion. Okay, It means to be rendered or fashioned in the same image as someone or something else. So what Paul's basically saying, now we know that Paul died the martyr's death. Y'all know that, right? Under Emperor Nero, Paul went to the guillotine and they cut his head off. So he wasn't scared to die when it came down to it, amen? But that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the physical death part. He's talking about something spiritually happening where he would become conformable to the death of Jesus, where he would begin to take on the form and fashion of Jesus. And so what we need to understand is that we can learn from the scriptures that Jesus was selfless. Yes, yes. Amen. And so, so the Spirit of God in the New Covenant, when He begins to cause you and I to be conformable to the death of Jesus, 
then what's going to happen is as we're being formed and fashioned into his image, we're going to look less like us, born of Adam, and we're going to start looking more like Jesus, born again, and the Holy Spirit having his work and his way in our lives. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Now, part of the problem is that if you don't know where to place and keep your faith, the book of Galatians says you can frustrate the grace of God. As a matter of fact, it says that. It says it in Galatians 2.20. It says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but he liveth in me. And now this life I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Then he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now, I don't mean to get all too fancy or technical on you, but the church of Galatia, they weren't Jews. They were Gentiles. And yet Jewish people, the same guys, right. coming over there, trying to wreak havoc, trying to c convert them over to their way of thinking, trying to frustrate the grace of God, trying to spy out their liberty. That's what Paul would say. They're trying to spy out our liberty like we've already been free in Christ and they're trying to get us to add stuff to. And what I'm just here to tell you this is that, yes, walking in the Lord, becoming sanctified, being changed on the inside, there's a process of time that takes place. And listen, I just want to encourage some of you here tonight. You know, like I was having a conversation with somebody earlier. And, you know, sometimes I think that when we start to understand the deeper truths of the new covenant and we understand that it's as simple. You know how deep it is? It's as, it's as simple as learning how to rest in what Jesus did. Yes. And many times we can understand something here and then somehow we lose the course from here to here. And I just want to encourage you tonight that if you're sitting in this place and you would say, I think I have it here, but somehow I lost the course from here to here. I just want to encourage you and let you know that he loves you. Amen. And that he's not going to quit on you. Yes, amen. Lord. That he's committed to you. Yes. He's committed to this covenant. He's a committed to this agreement. And he proved it. God the Father proved it by sending his son. Yes. Jesus proved it by offering his life. And it worked. And you know how? Because God proved it through the resurrection. Amen. There's an empty tomb. And you know, I, I love it when I get to witness the people on the outside of these walls. And I'm like, no, don't tell me he ain't alive. I know he's alive. Because the tomb's empty and he's in my heart, my friend. I know he's living in here. Amen. And so he said, I want to become conformable to his death. I want to start looking like Jesus is what he's saying. That's the simple version. I want to look like Jesus. And I want to begin to walk in the power of his death resurrection. Amen. Mm -hmm. So again, the Holy Spirit is conforming us. Amen. Uh, he, he, he died his death. I must be conformed to his death. I die in him. Not physically yet, but once born again, the mat born in Adam slowly dies as he yields to the work of the Holy Spirit. I think that's so important. There is a part in this. God is sovereign. God is in control. Amen. But there is a part to this where we koinonia, it's a fancy Greek word for fellowship, or agree with, or joint participate. We participate with the Holy Spirit, and we yield to the work of God. When we begin to study the word of God and we begin to believe what the song was singing, right? We say we're going to declare this song that I am saved or that I'm no longer the same. That I, we can declare this song. I, don't, I haven't written it yet, but we ought to write it. I'm a new creation. In, that's got to be next on the le list, uh, Rich. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. The old has passed away. The new, behold, the new has come. A new Creation. You can take that to the bank. That's what the word of God says. And if you'll believe that and put your hope and trust in that, you will begin to see that continuous action happening in your life. So now that you believe that, that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, and these things come at you, whatever these things are, whatever the weight is or the sin that so easily besets you is, right? We all got our little thing, all right? But, but, but whenever those things begin to to, to bring themselves our way whenever we begin to believe, no, that's not who I am. Right. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, and I've read the word of God, so I know <clears throat> right from wrong, and I understand that he's given me grace and strength 
and that I don't have to yield to the lie. Instead, I will yield to the truth and I will surrender. And when I do that, he pours in grace. Now, listen. I'm not going to write it on the board because I might want to write something different. I might take up all the space. But, um, yeah, you know what? I am. I'm going to go ahead and just do it. Look, the definition of grace. I think this is important. Grace. And I know that a lot of people have seen me write this before. It's a divine. What does divine mean? Something to do with God, right? It's not you. You're not divine, right? <laughs> a divine influence. On what? Most of y'all know this by heart. The heart. On the heart. And then what? Reflection in your mind. It's reflection in the life. Okay? So what does that mean? I heard one pastor a long time ago. Uh, he said the grace is an inside job. Yes. Okay? Grace is an inside job. So when we yield, so that's what the cross did. The cross made us a new creation. It clothed us with the righteousness of Jesus. And this gives the Holy Spirit access to do the work in our heart and in our lives. And when we learn to yield to that, we're given permission to grace. To Grace comes from the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's the change agent. It's the catalyst that causes the change to take place. I don't know nothing about body doing body work on a car, but I know that there's some kind of Something you put in the bondo, and it's what cha it's the chemical reaction that allows it to get hard. Grace is the chemical reaction that causes the change on the inside. Grace is the reaction, the catalyst that causes the the fruit to get ripe enough to where that to where that sin starts falling off the tree. It's a work of the Holy Ghost, is what I'm trying to tell you. It's the work of the Lord forming and fashioning and making us conformable to the death of Jesus, that the old man is dying and that the new man is being recreated in Christ Jesus. And so religion, religion wants to get in the way of that. Any kind of religion that, that you can think of wants to get in the way. Any religion wants to take away from the purity of the message of the gospel, right? You know, I was thinking how different Jesus and his cousin looked compared to to tra religious tradition and complacency. I'm talking about Jesus and John the Baptist. They were cousins. I don't know if you knew that or not, but if you didn't, now you know. Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins, okay? And and I want you to know right here in Matthew chapter 3, uh, you, you know, you can turn there if you want, but I'm just going to kind of read a little bit. Matthew chapter 3, starting at verse 7, what he said was he came to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, who are those? Those are those religious leaders. And, you know, we talked about religion last week, I believe, when we were talking about the woman with the alabaster box and how she had to walk into the crowd and how she had to see all these faces of all these religious folk. And I don't know about you, but I've been in churches before where there's a bunch of people with a bunch of religious looks on their face. And, they, and, and it's sad because their hearts are hard. They're not, like, really compassionate to see people be set free, right? And so, but what he said right here, this is John the Baptist. He, he looks at them, the religious leader. He said, you generation of vipers. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And, and then he goes down to verse 10 and he says this. Now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings forth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And then he goes on to say this, that he, ha he's going, he has a fan in his hand. This is verse 12. Jesus has a fan in his hand, and he's going to thoroughly purge his floor. He's going to gather his wheat into the garner. That's a storehouse. And he's going to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. I want you to know something. There ain't no chaff going to make it into the kingdom. That's right. All right. That's right. He's looking for pure wheat. And whenever we yield ourselves to him and submit ourselves to him, you know, you know the process. I didn't plan on getting into this really, but the process of removing chaff from wheat is a pretty laborious process back in the old days. They stick it in this on this threshing floor and they get some beasts of burden to roll big old millstones on top of it to, to where it kind of like cracked that outer layer off almost like a piece of popcorn to get that kernel off. And then next thing you know, they would it, in the open wind, they take almost like a pitchfork and they throw it up in the air and the chaff would blow away to be burned, right? And then the wheat would be stored. See, you can't make bread with chaff. Right? You, you, you can only make bread with wheat. 
right? And the Lord is looking to put a work on the inside of our life. And listen, good news is this, is he's made the provision of grace yes. for the chaff to be removed so that we could become the bread. Yes. He is the bread of life, amen. But he's trying to do a work on the inside of us, amen, so that we can have proper relationship and have communion with him. The Lord wants to have communion with us, amen. So I wanted to tell you, though, you know, about the acts. I was praying right here Monday morning, and, and I was as I was praying, I saw in my, in my heart, in the, I had a little vision of an axe head, and it, and it was doing this number here, and it was chopping in a downward action. And then the Lord gave me the scripture that the axe is laid to the root. Now, I want to talk to you real quick because, you see, what he was trying to tell them is, is this, is that religion had become dry and dead. And John the Baptist said, you generation of vipers who has told you to come out here. He said for them to give meat that is worth of repentance. In other words, show forth the fruit of repentance. Amen. And that's really still the message today yes. for God's not winking at sin anymore. We learned in Acts 17 recently that, that he used to, he used to forbear and look over sin. He had the law, but now he's given the world Jesus and he's demanding that men everywhere repent of their sin. And so this, this root is the foundation. I'm talking about the root right now. And that's what I was going to try to draw. I don't know how good of, I'm not really the greatest of artists, but if, but if this was the, a, the, a tree, then this is the root, okay? This is the root system down here. And what I want you, I'm trying to try to give you an idea, like this isn't supposed to be a palm tree, but this is supposed to be some branches, okay? On this side, and then there's also some branches on this side. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to get too deep, but at the same time, I'm trying to make a point. I want you to, to envision this as the Old Testament or Old Covenant and this as the New Testament or the New Covenant, okay? And that these branches over here represent the natural branches. You ever read Romans chapter 11? It said that there's natural branches and then there's wild olive branches. And that the wild olive branches were actually grafted in, okay? There's a special process in horticulture or the... Anyway, well, you got to you got to make a cut to put the branch in there. OK. And so what I want you to know is this, though, is that the root system, the root is like the foundation of God's plan. OK, the root system is the foundation of God's plan. See, there's a whole world of dead people walking around upon the earth. The whole world of dead people that were born in Adam in yes. their first birth and born into sin and that God has been committed to a plan from the beginning of time. We don't really have time to go all the way backwards, but I will say this, that when Adam and Eve attempted to cover themselves with fig leaves, God said, that's not going to work, and killed an innocent animal and clothed them with the skins of that animal. So what we're seeing here is that the Lord's already proclaiming the gospel in the very beginning, and he's saying it's going to require a blood sacrifice of an innocent animal. Vic victim, if you want to call that animal that, is going to require a, a, a innocent sacrifice, which ultimately we know was Jesus. Amen. So the root system is the plan that God has to bring salvation to the world. Amen. But and, and the branches, what are branches supposed to do? Branches are supposed to bear fruit. And I have to tell you that Israel, according to God's plan, did bear fruit. Now, we also know that they fell into idolatry. We also, and what are you talking about fruit? Because through Israel, the world was given Jesus. Yes. Amen. Yes. And that was God's plan the whole time. And so Israel was, was, was this side of the branches and the church is this side of the branches. Israel looked forward to the day when Messiah was going to come, right? You understand what I'm talking about? All the prophecies said that Jesus was coming. And Israel looked forward to that day. And then over here on this side, we as the church look backwards at the day that he came. But what I want you to know is this, is that Jesus is the tree or he is the vine, if you will, right? That's what the word says in John chapter 15, that he's the vine and you're the branch, amen? You're the branches. Now, now I want you to see this right here. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. 
Because you see, by the time Jesus shows up on the scene in, the, in, the, in this timing, that the Pharisees have just stripped the people of really what their relationship with God was supposed to be. And so religion had become dry and dead. And that's why John the Baptist said the ax is laid at the root. He's getting rid of this system right here and he's bringing in the new system. Amen. So this is what it says in Isaiah. Now you got to understand this is about 700 years before Jesus is born. And it says, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Everybody know who Jesse is? Say it louder. David's daddy, thank you. So Jesse is David's daddy. You know all the prophecies that are connected to David, right? That the king uh, that the king that would rule for all eternity was going to come from David's lineage, okay? And so he says, that now, I mean, I'm, this is after David has already been born. This is after David has already reigned. This is after David has already gone home to the Lord. Okay, David's not alive at this time of this prophecy. All right, but this is what it says. But but all of Israel knows that Messiah or the King is coming from David's lineage. Does that make sense? And so when Isaiah prophesies this, the, the readers know that he's talking about the offspring of David. Does that does that make sense? Okay. So then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Next verse. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. And then it begins to explain the various aspects of the Spirit of God. But what I want you to see is this, is that you can see this dry stump that's sitting there. This is a prophetic picture of exactly how it was when Jesus showed up upon the earth, that religion, that, that the stump had been cut down and it just soon looked like it was dead. It, it, it just to look like it was. Have you ever felt that way in your time, in your times of, of, of whenever you were away from the Lord, even at times, maybe as a Christian that you felt like, man, I just feel like I'm dead. I, I feel like there's 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 like it doesn't seem to be any hope. And you really didn't even necessarily know any better. You were like a dried up stump. But have you and I know that if I ask some of you to raise your hand and you would say, yes, that happened to me, that even though you were like a dried up stump at one point in time that the Lord showed up, amen, and he poured water on it, and then all of a sudden, that green sprout shot out, amen, and that's what he was talking about, that green sprout that was talking about coming out of that dead stump was actually Jesus, a root that comes from Jesse is going to come forward, amen, and so what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that Jesus came to lay the axe to the root system of dead dry religion, of, of, of business as usual, of complacency and tradition. Jesus is coming to shake things up. Amen. Amen. Jesus shook things up. Yeah. Hallelujah. Jesus still shakes yeah. things up. Yeah. You start talking about Jesus in public enough and yeah. especially around religious folk and it starts shaking things. Amen. Yeah. It, gets all conf it gets all chaotic, not confusing, but it gets chaotic. But I'm here to tell you, praise God, Jesus he still wants to shake some things up, amen? Yeah. And that's how he works. The spirit of the Lord is upon him. That's the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, look, I, I didn't expect this to happen, but earlier the Lord started putting some of this on my, on my heart about the spirit of religion will show itself in different ways. We'll see how far we get with this. It's already 10 to 8. I'm not going to keep you all night. But the spirit of religion will manifest itself in different ways. I, if you're going to be quick, draw McGraw on the scriptures back there, we're going to try to move through fast. First of all, I want you to know this. I don't know if you're taking notes. Number one, it wants to be seen and get recognition. The spirit of religion wants to be seen. See, because look, I don't know about you, but I'm transparent. Y'all can throw spaghetti at me next week, okay? I'll try to be transparent, and I can tell you right now, I have been bound by a spirit of religion, all right? So that's why I can recognize this stuff. So well, all right. And so what maybe what we do is, is that instead of, you know, looking at our neighbor, we try to look in the spiritual mirror and we try to see whether or not some of these symptomatology, some of these symptoms are connected to us. All right. So the spirit of religion wants to be seen and get its recognition. Matthew 23, 5, Jesus said this, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. Come on. 
Come on. <laughs> and look, John 12 and 40, 42 through 43 says this. Nevertheless, many of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. That's the spirit of religion. right? There. Number two, it wants its dignity and respect more than God's will. Matthew 23, 6. They love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogue. And greetings in the marketplaces being called rabbi by others. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Look, I got to be honest with you. I got to turn to this in the Bible because we got to go up. Y'all can go to uh, Matthew 20 and then y'all can go up to verse 17 on the screen if you want. I don't even know if I can read it. Yeah, starting at verse 17. I'm in the NASB, which y'all are. That's okay. Yeah. You in the King James? Yeah. Okay, cool. I figured that because that's the only one you recognize. Huh? Now I'm just messing. <laughs> Here we go, verse 17. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside. And on the way, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified and he will be raised up on the third day. Now I wanted you to see that because you're not you can't hardly even believe what happens next. You ready? Now look at verse look at verse uh, 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons and kneeling before him she asked him something. And he said to her, "What do you want?" She said to him, "Say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom." Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I will drink? I just cannot get over the audacity of that. I've preached that before more than once through all these years, and I just still cannot get over the audacity. Jesus just has a come to Jesus meeting with his disciples, and he says, we're about to go to Jerusalem. I'm about to get beat. I'm about to get flogged. I'm about to get mistreated. I'm about to die on the cross. And then the sons of Zebedee's mama says, hey, what, can my one of my sons sit on your right hand and the other one of my sons sit on your left hand? Jesus goes on to explain in one of these passages where this happened. He says that the Gentiles, so talking about people that don't know God, they lord over one another. They want the, the best. They, they want to exert authority over people. You understand what I'm saying? And that and we and don't have you ever met anybody that's got a power trip before? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and a lot of times that's, that's all that can be connected to a spirit of religion too. Listen, if you, if you have an authority position, praise God, you have authority, but you ain't got to have a power trip over it. Come on. Jesus didn't have a power trip. He had all the, you know, because if he did, he would have called down those legions of angels just to show them who the boss was. Okay, but he didn't do that. Amen. He, he humbled himself. Praise God. All right. So it, wants, uh, so it wants dignity and respect more than God's will. It can't, it can't see the value in someone else's ministry. Matthew 26, 8 through 9, and we talked about this last week. When his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. They could not recognize. See, whenever, whenever somebody's bound by a spirit of religion, they can't see anything else. All they see is, is them, themselves and how important that they are for, for, to do God's work. And then if somebody else comes in, they, that other person may be gifted by God to do something for the Lord. But they seem trivial through the eyes of a person that's bound by a spirit of religion. And I can tell you that that's not God's will for us to operate that way. God wants us to, to be humble. And God wants us, I, you know, I want my brothers and sisters in the Lord to thrive. Amen. Yeah. I mean, I hope that you would want that for me. Right. You know, I, I want, but I want my brothers and sisters in the Lord to thrive. I want people to gain an understanding of the yeah. word of God. I want them to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And I want them to live for Jesus outside the walls of the church. 
Because listen, if we're actually doing the work of the ministry, that means that we're that part of it is that we have an evangelistic uh, zeal in us, amen, and that we're telling others about the good news of Jesus. Amen. Praise God, amen. Don't let somebody tell you different. Don't let somebody tell you normal church. I don't care how striving the worship is. I don't care how good the preacher is. Don't let somebody tell you that normal church is us just sitting up inside the walls of this house. This is not that. No, 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 no. We're supposed to come here, get filled up, get, amen, and take our Jesus back outside the walls of this church and let somebody know the good news about Jesus. And we're all going to do it differently. Praise God. We're not all the same. Thank you, Jesus. All right. It has malice in its heart towards others. I'm just going to tell you the love chapter says this is the opposite of religion. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. I don't know about you, but I can see myself in some of that. I'm willing to admit it. I don't know if anybody else can admit it. I don't want that in my life. Come on. All right. It is controlling and thinks that it's the only one that can help you. Uh, Luke, you ain't the only one. Like, you know, I, one of my favorite preachers used to say that all the time. You are not God's handyman for the hour. Oh, by the way, Brother Solomon's going to be here on the 17th. Amen. And Rabbi Ron will be here on April the 7th. Amen. And I just secured Brother Larson June the 1st and 2nd. And on June the 1st, on a Saturday, we're going to have an all-day teaching on the New Covenant. Amen. And so you might want to pencil that into your... Uh, no, it's 16th is a Saturday. That's why I brought it up. 16th is a Saturday. I'm sorry. You're right. Somebody corrected me. And I meant to announce it. So it's the 17th. Yeah. Psalm. Yeah. All right. So, so love is patient. All right. Let's see here. It's controlling, right? That's what I said. It's controlling and thinks it's the only, that it's the only one that can help you. John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and we forbade him because he follows not with us. Jesus said unto him, forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Right? And there's another passage in Numbers in the Old Testament. I love this passage. El dad and me dad, you know, I guess they were twins. I don't know. But, but it says that somebody comes running and says, Moses. El dad and me dad are prophesying in the camp, and then Joshua hears it, and Josh is like, Moses, make them stop. And Moses is like, Oh, you're you you have an envy for my purposes? You're trying to help me out? He said, I wish that all God's people be filled with the spirit and prophesy for God. Amen. And and that's the spirit of religion will try to make you like, huh, I don't know what kind of word that was that they thought that they were bringing. You know, and, and look, Lord, help us that our work that our hearts would be right. And look, sometimes the word that somebody's bringing ain't right. <laughs> Okay, sometimes the spirit somebody's operating in isn't right. All right, and we need to be able to discern that. That's one of the gifts of the spirit, praise God. And now I'm not talking about just like let anything in, seeker, seeker sensitive, and let everybody, you know, everything goes. And all. no, 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 like I want the truth, amen. And I want to seek and, and find the truth by the grace of God. But at the same time, I don't want to be. Thinking that, you know, I got something figured out over here, Lord. I want to be, I want to have a teachable spirit. Amen? Amen. If it feels threatened by you, it will try to make you ineffective and it will try to kill you or your ministry. In Luke 4, there were many lepers. Look at this. Many lepers. Jesus is preaching this now. He's in the synagogue. Okay. And he's reading from the scroll. And he, and he says, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of prophet Elijah. Actually, this is where he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the good news. Okay. And then he says that this prophecy is fulfilled before you in your eyes today. And then they're kind of like looking. And then he starts, then he goes here. <laughs> You're like, I'm telling y'all, y'all, Jesus, y'all think man, Jesus wasn't playing with people. This is what he says. He says, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them were cleansed, but only name in the Syrian. Now, you got to understand what he's saying is there was a whole lot of us Jewish folk that were full of leprosy and Elisha didn't heal none of the none of our brothers. But Naaman the Syrian, who was a Gentile and was actually worshiping a false god at the time, 
came over here to seek help from the prophet. And then he goes on to say this, that, that Naaman the Syrian was the only one that was cleansed. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. They rose up, they drove him out of the town, and they brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him off the cliff. I mean, they're just ready to kill Jesus right then and there. Here's the Messiah that they've been waiting on for thousands of years. And, and when he tells them this, because, see, they were full of religion. Their hearts were hard. And listen, I want you to know something. Whenever, whenever a tr somebody's speaking something to you, okay, and you feel conflicted in your heart over it, you got to check yourself. Because and you might you might want to just wait a second before you speak. I'm I'm, I'm I'm trying to give you some advice that I'm learning myself. Okay, you might want to just wait a second before you speak. Take some time if you can. And you can do that. You do have you do have control over your mouth. I know that James said whoever can control his tongue, you know, has control done a great thing. But self control is one of the fruits of the spirit. Right. Yeah. And if Come you on have been crucified with Christ, and if the Holy Spirit is living in you, amen, you can yield your tongue to the will of God, amen, and he can help you control your tongue, because that's a, that's a fruit of the Spirit, it's not your fruit, amen, and so what I'm trying to say is, is this, is that if something is done or said, and you feel all of a sudden conflicted in your spirit over that thing, like all roused up, you know, you remember that word I used, Last week, whenever Martha was comforted about with many things, and Jesus said, you're troubled. That word troubled is, is turbid. Y'all remember that word? I like that word. What does it mean? It means the water's clear till you put your hand down there and you get all that muddy silt to come up, then you can't see. See, sometimes our spirit feels like that. Whenever somebody comes at us or whatever, the case, I'm telling you right now, there's a place that you and I can walk where we are being led by the Holy Spirit, that the, that the accusers come against us, that people say bad things about us. And look, we can still have peace that surpasses Amen. understanding. Amen. That's the Prince of Peace living in our heart. Amen. And so I just want to encourage you to know that when you start to see that chaos build up, that's not the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. It, Jesus is not the author of confusion. All right. So we don't really have time to, to really delve into the rest of it. But in Mark 6, I was thinking about how Jesus was very selfless, right? So the spirit of religion wants to be exalted. It wants to be magnified. It wants to be recognized. But Jesus, on the other hand, was, we know that he was selfless because he laid himself down. There's scripture where he says that the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. But in the Mark 6 passage is where he multiplies the, the loaves and the fish, right? And what's interesting is that there's a lot of context going on. So Jesus just found out that his cousin died. Right, the story of Herodias tells her daughter, "Hey, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter." And so you get down here, and it's like they cut his head off, and his disciples went and got the got the corpse, and they buried him. And Jesus is uh, obviously aware of this news, and then his, his disciples come back, and they're like, "Jesus, the devils obey us." Right, and we 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 preached in your name. We cast out devils in your name. People were healed in your name. And Jesus can can read the room. He's good at that. And and he's and he can tell they're tired. Right. And he says, Hey, listen, I know y'all are tired and hungry. And he actually recommends it. Let's let's go over here and get you some rest. And let's get you let's get you rested up. Let's get you something to eat. But then the crowds follow him. Right. And Jesus sees the crowd, and he. He was stirred in his heart because he says he was moved with compassion. See, right. and and so even in the midst of all of that, even though everybody's tired, even though he's weighted down with all of those things going on in his heart and mind, Jesus tells the disciples, "Changing plans, guys. Can you can you go ahead and organize the crowd, right?" And you know, I was thinking. Man, they just got off of this major evangelistic cru crusade. <laughs> you know what I mean? Talking about people getting healed, devils getting cast out, preaching, seeing magnificent things. And it's like, can't you get somebody else to organize this crowd down in these, these groups of people? Can't you get somebody else to pick up some scraps? We worn out, you know. But I was just thinking that so oftentimes I think that can happen to us, right? That we get tired in life. Things are going on in our lives. There's a lot happening. 
and we just kind of like get, we get worn down. You know, and I just want you to know that the Lord wants us to be committed to as well. I'm not even talking about coming to church. I'm not that kind of preacher. I think that we're supposed to come to church. It says forsake not the gathering of the brethren, but that's not what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about being committed to the king and kingdom. I'm talking about that no matter how tired we are, that whenever the Lord puts somebody in our path, we need by the grace of God to perk up. Amen. And to do what it is. That he's asking us to do yeah, right. so that we can be there in that moment. Amen. Right. Singers, musicians, if you could come up and we could close with a song. And we're going to ask the Lord to minister to our hearts tonight. Amen.